welcome to ID the Future. Once again, we have on the show with us today, Dr. Michael Behe talking to us about the evolution of chloroquine resistance and how it shows that there can be limits to how much complex traits can evolve. I'm Casey Luskin, and we're going to continue this discussion. So, Dr. Behe, thanks for coming back on the show with us. It's always great to be with you. All of this seems to have been potentially settled, this discussion, this debate over what does it take to cause chloroquine resistance, because a new paper has come out in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA, came out earlier this year, I believe in April, that discusses exactly what it takes, what is required to cause chloroquine resistance in malaria. So what did this paper say exactly? Yeah, well, a senior author was a guy named Summers, or the first author was a guy named Summers, and What they did was, by some elegant and laborious laboratory methods, they were able to take the gene for the protein which is changed to give malaria resistance, and they were able to intentionally put mutations at different places in this gene wherever they wanted to. So they'd run separate trials when they'd they'd try out all different sorts of mutations and combinations thereof. And then they would test it for what they thought was its necessary activity, and that's the ability to take chloroquine out of the digestive vacuole, pump it out. Essentially, it's a stomach pump. And what they discovered was that if they put in just one mutation of any of the ones that are found in nature of the resistant strains, that the protein, the protein pump, the stomach pump, wouldn't work. It didn't pump chloroquine. There was a minimum of two necessary before you got any chloroquine pumping activity. And so that would be the minimum number that you would need to have resistance to chloroquine. Interestingly, they also showed that with that minimum number, even though you had some chloroquine pumping activity, you still didn't get an increased survival of malaria cells in the presence of chloroquine in the laboratory. And then that suggests that maybe in nature, those two would not be enough and that you would need a third one on top of those, even though the first two are enough to give you that minimum amount of chloroquine pumping activity you might need a third one to increase that activity enough to make it relevant to help the malarial parasite survive. So essentially, Dr. Behe, this paper shows that you were right. (laughs) Yeah, let me do a little victory dance here. Yeah, (laughs) That's that's exactly right. And as I said a little bit earlier, it was not a big insight. Anybody could see it. And as a matter of fact, it was predicted by some folks in the malaria literature. And so when I wrote it in the book, I didn't expect much resistance on that point, but because Darwinian processes are supposed to be slow and tiny steps, this was kind of perceived, at least when I was talking about it, since I'm a skeptic of Darwinism, this was perceived as some sort of threat, and rightly so. (laughs) And so all of the reviewers, smart guys too, in good journals, denied that or poo-pooed it or played it down. But now, with the long work of Summers et al., we find out that it was correct after all. Well, I think you deserve to do a little victory dance here, Dr. Behe, and I think it's important to remember exactly what the critics said in response to you, and I'll refer our listeners to Evolution News and Views where they can read more about that. But, I mean, Ken Miller wrote in Nature that your inference that it would require multiple mutations to produce this resistance, he called that a breathtaking abuse of statistical genetics. He actually said it would be difficult to imagine a more breathtaking abuse of statistical genetics. Never mind, actually, that Richard Dawkins made a very similar inference with regards to a different trait in his book, Greatest Show on Earth, which came out a couple years after your book. Never mind that other scientists reason in the exact same way. For you, it's a breathtaking abuse. And I could go down the list. I mean, Jerry Coyne, Nick Maskey, Sean Carroll, even Richard Dawkins and PZ Myers, all these folks were attacking you quite harshly just for making this very I think, reasonable inference that mathematically speaking, the large number of cells that are necessary to evolve the trait suggest that you need a couple simultaneous mutations at least to get that trait to evolve. It doesn't seem like rocket science. Other people in the field have made these same kinds of inferences, but when it's a Darwin skeptic who makes this inference in a book that is trying to make an argument against the validity of Darwinism, they really circle the wagons. And I think that the personal vitriol that came out in some of the reviews of your book really shows how strongly threatened they felt by your argument. Yeah, well, you're preaching to the choir here. I'm not going to disagree with (laughs) anything you say. Yeah, like I said, it wasn't rocket science and other scientists in other 
less inflammatory contexts have talked about the rarity of getting two mutations at once and how difficult it would be. So, you know, it wasn't hard to see, but because it's in the context of doubting Darwinism, then you get jumped on with both feet. So it's just another example of the fact that scientists are not like Mr. Spock from Star Trek. They're not uh, unemotional logic machines. They have their interests and what they want to be true and not. And if you cross that, sometimes you can pay the price. Very well said, Dr. Behe. And one thing actually, though, that was nice that came out of all of these reviews of your book that were so adamant that this very rare trait had to evolve through sequential mutations was you got all these really nice statements from some of our leading critics saying that things can never evolve when they require multiple mutations before you get any kind of advantage. And really, these are sort of admissions (laughs) on their part that when you require simultaneous mutations before you get any kind of advantage, that that really causes a problem for Darwinism. And a lot of these folks, I don't know if they would have been otherwise so apt to make that admission, except for when they were attacking you, Dr. B. (laughs) So congratulations on getting our critics to admit sort of this deficiency and this potential obstacle to Darwinism. Now, they, of course, think that this trait doesn't require simultaneous mutations, but now that the data shows that it has, they're kind of a difficult place, I think. Yeah, I think they're trying to squirm out of it. I've seen in a post or two by P.Z. Myers on his site that they're seizing on the word simultaneous and saying, oh, no, no, they don't have to be simultaneous. And I think they mean that it doesn't have to be that the same cell gets the two mutations in the same replication cycle. When the DNA is a new copy is being made, the two mistakes don't have to happen in that same cell. I think what they're intending is that, well, you know, you can get one mutation, maybe even it's deleterious, makes the cell sick, but the cell can putter along a little bit and maybe go through a few generations and its progeny will still be sick. But maybe there will be more of that progeny and, you know, maybe one of those can get the second mutation. So it wouldn't be simultaneous in the dictionary sense. But they didn't follow their logic down. But as you say, it it doesn't matter because it's an event of 1 in 10 to the 20th. And so if you have 10 sick cells or 100 sick cells that could give rise to the second mutation, that's not going to help your math very much. And your math always has to get up to that number of 1 in 10 to the 20th. So if maybe you don't need two simultaneous mutations, you might need one and another that are close but not maybe identical, or or maybe even three that are at low frequencies in the population because they're all sick with one or more mutations. But that's not going to get you out of the 1 in 10 to the 20th number. So I think it's just a repeat of the original, let's hammer this all we can for anything we can because it's going in a direction that we don't like. My next question was going to ask you about the response from P.Z. Myers and Ken Miller to these research findings in this paper that both you and myself have written about in Evolution News and Views. I'll confess I actually haven't had a chance to read their response yet. I just had to put my beloved cat to sleep yesterday, and I've been sort of occupied with other things. But I'm going to go read it now, and this is very interesting that that is their rebuttal because – When we say simultaneous, we don't mean that both mutations have to arise at once in the same cell. What we mean is that they have to arise in the same lineage of cells. And it's very easy for multiple mutations to arise in a lineage when each one gives you a successive advantage. But when you require mutations along the way that are either neutral or possibly deleterious, then you don't have that advantage. There's no reason for selection to preserve those mutations. And the odds of you producing that trait go down at an exponential rate, essentially. And that's a real problem. And so, yeah, it's not the case that it has to be in the exact same cell. That's not what we were arguing. And that's not the problem. The problem is that these deleterious or neutral mutations in a pathway are very difficult to preserve. And so another way we might describe these is we call them multi-mutation features. They're features that require multiple mutations to be present before they give any advantage. And if some of those mutations don't give you any advantage, then the odds of them being retained in a population go down. It's a lot harder to evolve a trait. That's what we're talking about here. And this actually goes back to a 2010 paper by Douglas Axe, where he talks about the idea of stochastic tunneling. 
that you don't have to get all the mutations all in one single organism, but you do need to get them sort of in a lineage, and you can do the math and find out that even if you get them in a lineage, if some of those mutations in the sequence are deleterious or neutral, that drastically reduces your odds of evolving the trait almost as if, and not quite as if, you were getting them in just one organism, but certainly nowhere near the help that you get when the mutations provide an advantage. So this idea of stochastic tunneling is what we're talking about here when we are talking about getting mutations simultaneously or multi-mutation features. It's basically the idea that a trait requires multiple mutations before it gives you any, any advantage, and that's a real problem for Darwinism, whether you get them in a lineage or in one single organism. Yeah, it's important to remember that the Darwinian magic only works when something is better, so that natural selection selects it and increases the number of organisms that have that in the population, and that gives a larger population base then for the next mutation to come along. And if you don't get that increase in the number because the first mutation is neutral or you get a decrease because it's somewhat deleterious, then you don't have an increase in the number and the odds of the next mutation coming along are not bettered at all. It's essentially the same as pure dumb luck. Jerry Coyne actually admitted this point in his response to your book, the review that he published in The New Republic. He wrote, quote, it is indeed true that natural selection cannot build any feature in which intermediate steps do not confer a net benefit on the organism, unquote. Now, we're not saying that all those intermediate steps have to happen all at once, but even if you want to get those intermediate steps sequentially, there's no reason for natural selection to preserve them if they don't provide a net benefit. And so again, if they're neutral or deleterious, it's going to be very difficult for natural selection to build that trait. You're going to be relying on sort of just sheer dumb luck, and that's when the odds are not in your favor. That is a response from PZ Myers and Ken Miller. Then my response to that is, well, checkmate. You basically misunderstood our argument, and that's a concession of, I think, the validity of our point. Yeah, I, I think so. So it's essentially that they'll say some words which don't either address the point or maybe even agree with it, but they'll huff off and tell the readers of their blog or something that ID has put up another dumb argument. So I think that the real question here is not whether the arguments ID makes are correct or whether they're supported by the science when you look at it uh, objectively, they are. This resistance to ID is solely a sociological phenomenon that the folks in science, at least the ones who have the microphones, don't like it, don't like it one bit, and they will do whatever they can, fair or foul, to suppress it. And I think you're seeing that here. I think we've, of course, both seen it lots of places over the years. Uh, well, hopefully folks will not just read Ferengula, they'll also read Evolution News and expand their minds a little bit. Dr. Behe, I'd like to just close this out then. So your book, The Edge of Evolution, the main topic was what exactly is the edge of evolution? What can Darwinian evolution do and what can it not do? And of course, your argument has never been that Darwinian evolution can't do anything. I mean, you agree that there are many things that Darwinian evolution can do. And you've said multiple times that if one mutation gives you an advantage, that seems like the kind of thing that Darwinian evolution actually can do quite well to find and preserve that trait. So in light of these new findings from this paper and proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where would you put the edge of evolution in light of these findings from this PNAS paper? Good question. Uh, the edge is not two or, or three because that's what we saw with chloroquine. It's going to be more. And you've got to be a, a little bit sophisticated in that it depends on how many organisms you're considering. The more organisms, the greater the number of chances you have to get these lucky key mutations. So if you're malaria with this astronomical number of cells, you have a lot better chance at getting them than not. In my book, Edge of Evolution, I said, oh, it's probably closer to five or six individual mutations that would have to not have selective value before you hit the edge of evolution for the entire history of life. In the history of life, there have been 10 to the 40th cells and billions of years and so on. So you have to set it up a little higher. But you can also put nice limits on what you'd expect to happen for larger organisms. Malaria is a single cell and it can occur in very large numbers, but elephants and whales and birds and so on are not. And their numbers are 
a lot more restricted than for malaria. And you'd expect a lot less room for evolution to work in those. And with those, I would guess that two mutations like we saw for the chloroquine, you'd expect that malaria can do that, but I don't think mammals could do it, say, or vertebrates. So the question is then, what does it take to make a particular kind of mammal, say a bat versus a whale or something? Would you need to make changes that would require two or more mutations at the same time or simultaneous even? And if you do, you would not expect that to be doable by Darwinian processes. You'd expect that to require design. As you used in your Powerball lottery analogy, the idea would be that invertebrates or larger organisms that have smaller population sizes and longer generation times, you can't buy as many lottery tickets as you can, say, with bacteria or single-celled parasites like the one that causes malaria. You just don't have as many probabilistic resources to produce variation upon which selection can act. So I think that's a really good analogy for understanding your argument here as to why in some organisms maybe it can work better than others. But there certainly is an edge. We've seen that edge conceded by some of our opponents in the midst of this debate. And we've seen, I think, that your inferences, the way that you approach these questions, Dr. Behe, that traits sometimes require multiple mutations before giving an advantage, that that way of thinking about biology actually is correct. And so I want to just give you some congratulations on being proven right. Not that you needed this paper to come out to, I think, know that your argument had merit, but it's got to feel good. Yeah, it's, it's always nice. Something to point to when people give you grief. So it's nice to have a solid result in the literature. Okay, well, Dr. Behe, thank you so much for your time today discussing this with us. Great to be with you. I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future. Thanks for listening. <laughs> 